please check out my revised website at creationsciencefiction.com. It's a great resource now for answering creationist claims. There's also documentaries, lectures, my blog, and more. Like my Facebook page, too. And if you want to support what I'm doing, you can become a contributor at patreon.com. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at a lecture uploaded by Answers in Genesis on August 8th, titled Noah's Ark and the Flood, Science Confirms the Bible, featuring Dr. Georgia Purdom. Give our full attention and a warm welcome to Dr. Georgia Purdom. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you all um, this afternoon. And um, hopefully, I think the weather's pretty good. It's a little hot, but it's kind of nice to, no rain at least, so that's a plus for this area right now. And... Uh, yeah, we all know what happens when it rains too much around Ken Ham's Ark. He's likely to sue somebody over it again. Now she goes on and on about why people should believe in the Ark and how many animals might have fit on it, but I'm not really interested in that stuff. I wanted to get to the part where she talks about geology and paleontology. And so we're going to look at two major evidences, and that's the rock layers and the fossils. Now let's talk about the rock layers first, because many of us have been taught that the rock layers um, and other geological structures like canyons take millions of years to form. And we're used to seeing these geological columns, so to speak, that supposedly represent time. So the lower that you go in the rock record, okay, the lower down here you go, the older it is, the older the rocks are, the older the fossils are, and the, and the further up you go, the younger the rocks are and the younger the fossils are. And that's supposedly how it works. But the question is, is that really true? Or can these types of things form very quickly under the right conditions? Well, that looks like a pretty accurate representation of what we see. What she's talking about is Steno's law of superposition, where layers of rock are arranged in a time sequence with the oldest on the bottom and the youngest on the top, unless later processes disturb them. Steno was a Christian, by the way, and he may have discovered one of the founding principles of geology, but he never lost his faith. Taking this one step further, Smith and Cuvier are credited with the law of faunal succession, which says that fossils and groups of fossils exist for limited amounts of time, and that fossil plants and animals appear in the rock record in a definitive pattern. They also notice that some of the fossils in England match fossil layers found in France. This led to the idea that sedimentary layers can be correlated over great geographic distances and even between continents. All this helped lay the foundation for Darwin's theory of evolution. So we're going to watch a short video about the Mount St. Helens eruption that occurred back in 1980. Um, a vast majority of people in this room can remember that. I remember watching it on TV. It was pretty cool. Um, and what that um, event showed, not just in 1980, but even in the years following, that rock layers and canyons and other structures can actually form quickly under the right conditions, like a catastrophe. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons, canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock, 
in just days of cutting time. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. And vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade, similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. Okay, so what this showed us, a lot can happen, right, if you have the right catastrophic conditions, which we did at Mount St. Helens. They talked about these rock layers here. You can see the person at the bottom for an idea of scale. This is a lot of rock, right, and it was laid down in just a few hours. It didn't take millions of years, it just took the right conditions. You know, I'm really glad that she used that specific image because if you hadn't seen that red shirt, you might think it was a black and white photograph. And why is that? Because every one of those layers has the same origin, either volcanic ash or unconsolidated pyroclastic flow. While considered sedimentary layers, it's not really even considered rock. Does that look at all like what we see here in the Grand Canyon? Of course not, because these are alternating layers of limestone, shale, and sandstone. Not a single one of these layers you see here in the Grand Canyon formed the same way as the layers we see at Mount St. Helens, so her comparison is absolute nonsense. The video claims that before Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. Scientists were actually pretty familiar with rapid geological changes caused by major eruptions like this 1883 eruption of Krakatoa. Scientists have known for centuries that some layers form quickly because we see these processes happening today. The problem for young earth creationists is all these processes show localized flooding, nothing on a global scale. What mostly changed was our understanding of how ecosystems can rebound after suffering such devastating loss. They're comparing layers carved quickly in soft sand and mud with layers of hardened rock like we see at the Grand Canyon, and they say it's 40 times smaller? You can throw a rock across the Towler River Canyon and other little canyons formed around Mount St. Helens after the eruption. I've heard this 40 times smaller thing before from other creationists, but I never seem to get an answer of how they calculated it. The Grand Canyon is up to 18 miles wide. They show how some trees were buried standing upright, like the polystrate trees they talk about all the time. They'll claim that geologists believe the layers surrounding these trees take millions of years to form. But right here they're refuting themselves, showing how geologists understand that sometimes trees can be buried upright quickly. They talked a little bit about this canyon called Engineer's Canyon. This was carved out in nine hours. <laughs> That's all it took, right? It just took the right condition. So it's great observable evidence that it does not take millions of years for these types of structures to form. Now and take a picture from a different angle with a person in it for scale, you can see that you could easily throw a rock across this little canyon, and no one would ever claim it took millions of years for anything like that to form. Now, they talked about this canyon. It's actually quite similar in layout to the Grand Canyon. Now, it's a lot smaller, but similar in layout. And if you go to the Engineer's Canyon today, there's a river that cuts through the canyon. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, we know that that river did not make that canyon, right, because we observed it in the present. Well, I'm going to tell you the same is true if you go to the big one, okay? That river didn't make that canyon either. Um, and that's what you'll hear, that that river carved it out over millions of years. Now, there's lots of reasons why that is totally implausible, but just to share with you one of them, see the sides of the canyon and how steep they are, okay? How many have been to the Grand Canyon? I have. I have on geology and paleontology expeditions. What have you done there, Georgia? I've whitewater rafted down that part, okay, right? The, it's really steep because you look up and the sun doesn't even stay in the sky very long because it's just you're so crowded in because those, those sides are really, really steep. If it was millions of years old, those sides would not be that steep. They'd be, whoo, okay, they'd be laid back. They'd be all rotted away. They wouldn't look like that. And so we'll zoom out the camera there, little Dr. Georgia. Steep sides are really more of an indication of the type of rock that's being eroded, not the amount of time that's gone by. 
and we see evidence of erosion from miles in every direction. Time for Dr. Georgia to change gears here and move on to dinosaur fossils and soft tissue. All right, let's move on and talk about the fossils. And one of my absolute favorite finds when it comes to fossils is that we find soft tissue in dinosaur bones. All right, now, why is that so surprising? Because tissue doesn't last millions of years, right? And even though, um, and, and so that's a major problem because all dinosaur bones are dated to at least 65 million years old or older. So um, as a biologist and someone who has worked with tissues and cells and DNA and proteins in the lab, there's no way they can last millions of years. It's important to explain again that soft tissue is not the state that it is found in. Soft tissue is a type of tissue, a type of organic material. It's preserved by minerals and encased in permineralized bone. Right, even under pristine conditions, even when I freeze them to minus 80 degrees Celsius or put them in pure liquid nitrogen, it's, it, it can be a struggle. You gotta be really consistent with it. You gotta hope the electric doesn't go out. You gotta, put, you know, all of these things to keep these things preserved and in good shape. So there's no way that you would expect to see this under a microscope when you look at a dinosaur fossil. Yet Dr. Mary Schweitzer showed in the lab that under the right natural conditions, dinosaur soft tissue could reach a state of preservation in just a matter of weeks. Because what are you seeing here? This is bone, obviously, that they're looking at. But what you're seeing here are blood vessels, branching blood vessels. Bones has a lot of them. Bone has a lot of them. It's very vascular. What about these little reddish brown structures right here that look really round? Those are red blood cells in the blood vessels, all right? Now, when they first saw this, they were like, no way. <laughs> this can't be because there should be no structure left. It should be completely, completely obliterated because it's been millions of years, right? That's the idea. But it's not. It's there. And in fact, if you look at it, this is just one sample. It's stretchy, okay? And it looks like fresh bone. I actually worked with bone for my graduate study, so I'm very familiar with how this should look. If I didn't know any better, I'd say that's fresh bone, but it's not. Okay, it's from a fossil that's supposedly millions of years old. So I want you to listen to Dr. Mary Schweitzer. She was one of the first scientists to really study this and popularize it. And listen to what she says about her discovery. No, I'm not going to show this video clip because it's so old. It was done long before Dr. Schweitzer spent 10 years studying how these tissues could be preserved. Because she even says, I don't believe it, that's not possible, you need to do it again. She's taken a huge amount of heat for this find, okay, huge, right? Because it shouldn't be there if millions of years is true. Now, her lab and other labs, but especially her lab, is trying to find a way, you know what they're spending their time and money on now, is how these tissues could have lasted millions of years. Well, here's what I, I don't think they're ever going to find a way that tissues can last millions of years. They're just too fragile for that. What she's doing here is completely ignoring the fact that there's been 10 years of research on this and it's been backed with independent studies from scientists in other countries. Dr. Schweitzer's work that shows the role that iron from hemoglobin played in preserving these soft tissues has been confirmed by at least four other independent studies. I'll put a link to my article on this in the video description. You know what the better explanation is? It's only a few thousand years old. <laughs> um, because it was fossilized at the time of the flood. Because it was buried and preserved very, very quickly by a huge catastrophic flood that buried it deeply so that it could not fall apart. It could not decay that quickly. And that's why we dig it up and that's why we see it today, right? That is a much better explanation and it's absolutely consistent with what we would expect to see based on scripture. Sure, it's easier to believe that if you're gonna ignore 10 years of research and ignore the fact that it's already been explained. Dr. Mary Schweitzer has some advice for Dr. Georgia. I've used this clip before and I'll probably use it again. So I was recently in a Young Earth seminar where your research was used to support claims um, that working blood vessels, fresh blood cells and intact DNA had been found in dinosaur cells or dinosaur fossils. Um, is that a fair characterization of your research? <laughs> it's wrong on all counts. If these guys would take half the energy that they spend trying to prove that the world is young and use it to change the world around them, feed the hungry, take care of the kids, get the cats off the street, anything, that our world would be so much better, but they waste so much time and energy and effort on disproving that the world is old. Now, creation scientists are doing active research in this area as well. <laughs> That was a good one. She should do stand-up comedy. <laughs>